Hi everybody, welcome in. So, do you know what block is asked for most often in quilting? It's the log cabin block. Um, the log cabin block is super simple to make, so it's great for beginners. Um, it's great for scrap fabric or curated fabric collections. It's easy to do. It's super easy to do on your embroidery machine, and if you're new to us, that's exactly what we do here. Hi everybody, I'm Diana from Sew in Common, where we piece our quilts right on our embroidery machine, and then we turn around and we quilt them on our embroidery machine as well. Thank you so much for joining me, and if you've been looking for a video or instruction on how to do that type of block, the log cabin, then you're in the right place because the log cabin is our May 2023 block of the month. All of our blocks of the month throughout 2023 are completely free to you. Um, and I will show you later on how you can get your block of the month pattern. You get your written instructions, any visuals, any templates, and of course you get your digital files um, for uh, enable to do to enable you to do that piecing on your embroidery machine. With the block of the month this month, you'll need to have at least a five by seven hoop for your embroidery machine. Okay, so thank you so much for joining us. Now, for those of you that don't know. Um, I've been quilting a long time, over 55 years. Um, I know you can tell, right? <laughs> um, and so the log cabin was something I learned to piece by hand with my grandmother. Um, but in the late 70s into the early 80s, quilters started doing something different. We started piecing on our sewing machines. So not our embroidery machines yet, but on our sewing machines. And I thought my grandmother was gonna freak out when I told her that I was going to take a class to piece on my sewing machine. And she said, no, honey, you piece your quilts however you wanna piece them, because as long as it brings you joy and you love it, it doesn't matter how you piece it. And that's exactly how I feel about us doing it on our embroidery machine. If doing quilting is something you love and doing it with your embroidery machine is what brings you joy, then Welcome, and I'm so glad you're joining us. Um, and so I took a class back way back when on um, making the log cabin block. In fact, I went to a little local shop um, close to where my husband and I were living at the time, and I took a class called It's Okay If You Sit on My Quilt. And it is okay if you sit on my quilt. We do that. That's what quilts are for in our house. Sitting on them, covering up with them, snuggling up on the sofa with them, whatever you want to do. That's what our quilts are for. And so um, I went and I took this class and I was learning how to piece with my sewing machine. And so let me show you. I know I have it here. Here we go. I have a little block. This one I'll show you first. This was a log cabin that I pieced on my sewing machine. You can see on the back, right? And um, the general idea of a traditional log cabin is half of it is light, half of it is dark. Now this one is modified a little bit because this center piece here is made up of three tiny squares, but in traditional um, log cabins, a lot of times it's made up of just a single a center square and that's what we're going to be doing this month is that single square. But before I get into more about this month's block, I want to tell you more about this book called It's That It's Okay If You Sit on My Quilt Book. Um, and it was by Mary Ellen Hopkins. She was a lovely lady, funny lady, and super talented. And in this book, she has a whole chapter on the log cabin. And so back then what was really trendy was we were learning how to strip cut and strip piece our um, fabrics. And so doing a log cabin that way was super simple. But the other thing that Mary Ellen talks about is the idea that with a simple log cabin block, you can do what she calls log cabin sets and create tons of quilt layouts. I mean, there's just a few of them on this page but you can make tons of them. And she had another book called A Log Cabin Notebook. 
it's book number five. You can barely see it, but it's book number five. On the Log Cabin, again, by Mary Ellen Hopkins. And in here, she shows us all kinds of quilts made with only log cabin blocks. Now, I know you're saying there's no way that's just log cabins, but it is. Some of these, you make a couple of different um, colorways in your log cabin to put them together. So you can make stars. That's part of what Mary Ellen said. You can make all kinds of what we think of traditional quilt blocks with log cabins, like our basket here, another star, just all kinds. And your log cabin can be solid or it can be print, whatever you prefer, or a combination of both. And so I love this book for inspiration. I just absolutely love it. Now, I will tell you that both of these books are technically out of print, but I know that occasionally if you go on Amazon, you can find them. And I will put these books um, in the description of the video today so that you can see the titles and all again. You don't have to worry about trying to copy them down now. But these books inspired me for this month's log cabin. So when I was digitizing our log cabin block, I thought about generally what is a traditional log cabin block. It's a solid square in the center. Typically, traditionally, it's red, meaning fire or the hearth of the home. And then half of it is in lighter colors, half of it is in darker. And that's what I kind of did here. But my lighter colors, I'm considering the yellows and beiges. And my darkers, I'm considering my aquas and greens. But you could be much more specific, like I was in this block, and do really actual darks on one side and all lights on the other. Now, this block is all done in prints. You can really hardly tell because as we've talked about before, these are all prints that read as solid. Now in this block, you can tell they're all prints pretty easily. This one and this one I might use as a print that reads as solid if it worked with an overall quilt, but definitely those are all prints and that's fine too. Now in your um, uh, instructions, you're going to get a placement template. And I wanted to show you that right now. Your instructions will have all of your sizes for cutting fabrics and things like that. And we're going to kind of use a little bit of that old fashioned method. Well, old fashioned I say now, but that older method of using strips. So you'll see that um, when we demonstrate how to stitch this out. But on this template, there's a couple of things that I like to do. I like to take my ruler and I like to draw a line diagonally from corner to corner with just a pencil or pen, whatever you want to do. Because what that helps me do is then come in here and say which side will be my lights and which side will be my darks. And then I just write that in as well. That way when I am piecing around, because you kind of piece around in a count or a clockwise uh, direction, um, you'll know if you should be grabbing a dark fabric or a light fabric. And that line helps you delineate which half is which because sometimes when you're doing this, it can get a little confusing on where you're at, especially if you're piecing this in uh, on a sewing machine or by hand and you start rotating your block as you're piecing, you can really get confused over where your colors go. But that simple line will help you fix that problem and it'll help guide you. And as I do my pieces, I put a check in each one. That way I know that I'm done. Now, the very outer row is number 10, 11, 12, and 13. And you're going to see this when we do our piecing that um, whereas we're trimming the fabrics on all the other pieces, when we get to these outer ones, we're not going to trim because when we trim it, we'll trim it out of the stabilizer at that point and you won't need to, so you don't need to worry about pre-trimming it because you always want to make sure you have at least a quarter inch um, past your seam line so that you have your quarter inch seam allowance there, okay? 
When we go to do our demonstration, we'll talk more about stabilizer and things like that. Um, and if you've done my blocks before, you this follows the same kind of idea with stabilizers and all. Um, so you can always, you know, fast forward through that little pit bit if you like. So this month we are doing that block. Now I know some of you that's been following are going to say, Diana, normally when we do blocks of the month, there are 15 by 15 inches. That's correct, they are. And next week you're going to find out what the set, remember I talked about the um, log cabin set idea that Mary Ellen taught. Um, next week you will see the set that I'm going to do for us so that you know what the overall block will look like. But this week I don't want to pile too many things onto you, so this week we're going to worry about doing the actual log cabin itself. And this finishes as a five by five block. So again, it will fit into a five by seven hoop. And um, then next week, you'll see how this is going to get laid out as a log cabin set, okay? So I didn't want you to be concerned about that because I know some of you are going, wait a minute, that's not normally how the block of the month goes, but it, we're changing it up a little bit this month. You guys have been learning so many things so far this year, so we're ready to move on to that next kind of a scenario, and I thought the log cabin would really be the best way to do that. So, are you ready to do the demonstration to see how we stitch it out? Great, so hang on with me, and we're gonna go over to the embroidery machine, get our fabrics and stuff ready, and then we will be ready to do that stitch out. So let's go do the stitch out. Okay, everyone, so before we get started at the actual machine, let's just discuss fabric a tiny bit more and let me tell you about tools that you're going to want um, to have handy. So these are some of the fabrics that I used for my block. Um, this is a Lori Holt collection. I don't know which one it is, um, but if you like Lori Holt, um, I know that her fabrics get sold quite often at the Fat Quarter Shop, so you could check there if you want there online. Okay, so when I went to check for my fabrics, I did choose one of the reds for my center. I'm a little bit of a traditionalist, I guess, when it comes to my log cabins. I like that red center, but let me tell you, if you use red in the center, that doesn't need to dictate your darks and lights in any way whatsoever, okay? Um, it's just that center square to indicate that hearth of the home, the fire. Um, however, if you don't want to use red, you could use any of your other colors. Um, just choose, I guess, one of the darker ones and then work out from there. Um, but I think you'll like the quilt when you finish or the overall block set when you finish if you have those red centers too because those reds will really pop out. But I know there are some of you, I have a good friend, she just absolutely despises the color red, so I know she's not going to use that color in her blocks, but the rest of you can uh, choose to do that either way. But I chose one of the reds, and I have a little piece cut here. And then when I was looking through here, this set, so this is, uh, this is half of a layer cake. So things I wouldn't use, I love that fabric. Look, the ladies, the 50s, I mean, that's how my mom used to dress. I love that um, when I was a kid, but I wouldn't use that in here, and you can see why. You wouldn't, you'd get half an arm and a head and maybe the torso. I mean, it's just not a good size pattern for a log cabin. Um, would I use this? Sure I would, because if I were going to do it all as a light, I wouldn't care what you saw there, so I might go ahead and use that. There was one other one in here I wanted to show you that I might not use. Well, no, you know what, I take that back. I might use that one because, again, once it's cut, 
it, they're just kind of circles or gears or whatever she's trying. Well, I think maybe she's trying to indicate um, crocheted pieces there. That kind of reminds me of like a granny square and a round granny kind of an idea for uh, crochet. But if you cut those across, you get all your colors. So yeah, I might use that one, but definitely I would not probably use that one. But I just go through, so if you're using a curated set of fabrics, that's going to be a little bit easier because there are things in there that match closely and you know if you put them together, they're going to work. Because when I first looked at this, I thought, oh, green and aqua, but sure, they work because all of those, especially by adding these dots, because these dots have all the colors in them, so that worked out great. And then I chose my strips. Now you'll get your strip size and all in the instructions, but I just cut my strips and I cut a little square because there will be some trimming. And now I'm ready to um, uh, use that as my fabric. Now regarding other tools, um, you're going to want a good pair of quilting snips, um, embroidery, anything like that. I really like um, the um, Karen K. Buckley, because of their uh, serrated edge, um, gives you a really clean cut that way. Um, two things you might wish to have is a seam roller. Um, you'll see that this method is flip and stitch. So when we flip it, you roll that and keep that nice and flat while you're stitching it out. And a fabric glue stick works really great if you want to hold your smaller pieces down while you're stitching. Any fabric glue pen or non-toxic glue pen will work great. I always keep a pencil handy for when I'm marking up my template and things. And then I like to piece in a light dove gray thread. Any brand light dove gray works great because it blends in with everything. You don't see it and there's no real reason to use your pretty color thread when you're trying to do your stitching. Um, so save that pretty color thread for when you're doing your quilting. Okay, so now let's go over to our embroidery machine and let me just bring over my tools. So here I am, I've got my fabrics, I've got my tools here, I've got my design on my machine and I've got myself hooped up and ready to go. Now, we didn't talk about stabilizers, but I will go over them briefly because there are different ones you can use and it's really entirely up to you. My new favorite is a good old fashioned wash away. It works great because when I'm done, I can trace my seams with a water pen or a brush dipped in water and peel off the sections, get that out of there, and then I don't have any stabilizer left in my thing. And I didn't have to go and soak this to get that out. I just peeled it out. Look at some of my previous videos when we talk about that and you can see some actual demonstrations um, for that kind of um, an idea with the wash away, but I really like it. You can also use a poly mesh, works really well. A poly mesh will stay in and over time, that'll be great for your quilt because it will allow you to keep your, um, your quilt in good condition over time, give it a little bit more longevity. Um, if you want an all natural stabilizer, then a very lightweight muslin will do the trick. And again, in some previous videos, I've talked about that. I'll see if I can't um, link some of those for you at the end. So the, we're going to go ahead and stitch out the whole piece, one whole square, so you can see. So I'm ready to start and do my first one. The very first thing I do, now hang on just a second, let me, let me remove this. I have my gray piecing thread in here, but I'm going to put a black thread in here so you guys can see that e more easily while we're doing the demo. I had forgotten to change that over. That's just a quick little change and I can show you, this is actually my favorite gray for this. Let me grab my, hmm, I think I have them here somewhere. There we go, my magnifier so I can actually see. This is Isacord number 080814. Uh, it's my favorite piecing thread, my favorite color for piecing. Um, and the reason I like it is because Isacord has a little bit more of a flat 
finish to it or a matte finish a little bit. Um, it's not been cottonized and that's a whole different thing. But um, a lot of my other threads, like I really love this really beautiful um, light aqua one from um, uh, Designs and Oh, this is actually Isocord too. That's not the one I want to show you then. I want to show you one from Dime. Yeah, this is an, a Designs and Machine Embroidery thread. See the difference? Not just the color, but see how this has a beautiful shine to it? I don't want a piece with a beautiful shiny thread all the time. I want to save that where you're going to see it. It's going to make a difference. So I'm just going to go ahead and um, thread my machine with um, a black thread so that you guys can see it. Now, it really doesn't matter. If you don't have gray thread and you have white or light beige or something like that, that works perfectly okay, too. That's just fine. Sometimes white can get seen um, where gray really doesn't. Gray, just that light dove gray really just blends beautifully. But it's entirely up to you what you use to piece. I piece with 100% polyester, which is perfectly fine. Um, I've talked about that in the past as well with our newer fabrics and all. It works great. Um, alrighty, now let's go ahead and stitch out the very first square. Now this very first square, what's going on here is that it's giving us a placement line for our fire square. Okay. Now this is obviously bigger than I need, but that's okay. I'm going to trim it. So I'm just going to set that over the square and my next step will tack it down. So it's almost the same step repeated, um, but one is for placement, one is for tack down. Now I will actually take this out of my machine and I'm going to I'll adjust my camera downwards so you can see. There we go. Um, and I'm going to trim this. And I like to trim eh, an eighth of an inch away from my seam. I don't need to trim a quarter of an inch away at this point because you're going to get that quarter inch when you keep stitching. But if you want to, I mean, if that makes you feel better, that's fine. And you can see right as I'm doing this, I'm eyeballing it. I don't get out any measuring tools at this point. And that little bit right there will just go over into the bin. Now let me bring, put this back on the machine and bring up my camera again. There you go. Now, the next thing is that was number one. And so I will check it off. So I'm done with number one. Number two let me get that so you can, there you go. Number two is right above it, and look where it is on my chart. I've decided that the upper half will be dark and the bottom half will be light. Doesn't matter, I could have reversed that. It's not going to make a difference either way. Um, but I know for me, this should be one of my dark fabrics. So let's look at the one I've created already. My darks are the greens and aquas. And because I want these to kind of match up, I'm going to choose that little um, green with the dot. So let me grab that. And because these are a little bit bigger, you're working with bigger strips, I just make sure there's at least a quarter of an inch or so or half an inch on one side and half an inch or so on the other side. So if it's a little bit big, it does not matter to me at this point. And your second and all subsequent fabrics are always face down. So first fabric, always face up. Second and sub subsequent fabrics always start out face down because we've stitched. Now I'm just going to show you what I would do with glue. I put a little glue stick there. And then the second part of that is flip, right? So stitch, flip, press that out. Now if I wanted to, I could come in here with my little seam roller we get it down and then the third part of that flip stitch or a uh, stitch flip and stitch again and it's going to stitch this right down now i always give you fabric sizes that are generous i you never know where how folks are i'm going to now take this out 
and I'm going to trim right around here. I'll show you. Um, you never know where people are in their quilting journey, so I always like giving you an abundance in your fabric um, for cutting because if you're new, you might it might make you feel a little bit more confident. If you've been at it for a while, but you know that you like to work with extra fabric, that's fine too. Um, so I just like to make sure you have enough. Now, so that is number two. I will check that off. Now when I look at my chart, number three, look where that is. It's in the light category. So I'm gonna choose one of my light fabrics. And I know for me, I'm just bringing my finished one over. It needs to be that kind of a beigey color. Is this one long enough? Nope, I need to start out with a different one, a different piece. Okay, so I am going to come up here. So I know I don't need to really give it much more than where I have that other fabric. Lay it down, put it back in, and we're going to stitch this down. Now, you can use your glue stick again for when you flip. You do not have to use a glue stick at all. Um, sometimes with smaller pieces, it's a little bit helpful. Helps you keep your fingers out of the way. And um, some of you know, I, I just, I actually, my finger has healed up really well. I can't even tell where any of that nonsense happened. It um, just healed up super well. I can feel it when I rub my finger over it. I can feel the scar there still, but it really didn't, it wasn't turning out bad. First time in over 55 years, I cut myself with a rotary cutter. I was a little shocked more than anything. <laughs> I didn't even think that I had really cut it badly, but in the end, I did give it a pretty, it was deep. It wasn't horribly long, but it was super deep. So I'm just trimming my beige away, setting my longer piece over to the side because I know I'm going to use that again. And there is my third piece. Now let's look at our chart and I'm going to put my little check here for my third one. Now my fourth one, it is also still in the light. So on my finished one, I use this little fabric. So I will grab that. And I'm going to lay that down right there. And stitch. So you can see how easy this is, and really this is all you do all the way around, but I want to show you the whole thing because those of you that have been with me for a while, you know how this rolls. You guys, you guys could do this in your sleep probably, but we always have new folks joining us and I want to welcome everybody who is joining us for the first time. Um, Please don't forget to hit your subscribe button and the little bell to set notifications so that you know when videos come out because although we have a new block of the month um, video every Sunday, so the first week of the month I tell you about the block and we do the demo. Um, and then the second week of the month um, is always inspiration. And so next week your inspiration is going to be, you're going to get to see the actual um, uh, the actual log cabin set or layout that we're going to use. Third week of the month was always a quilting pattern, but sometimes we, we've decided to mix that up a little bit. Um, and then the fourth week of the month is always our live Q&A, and you can see any pattern or overall project that we're going to do for the month. So... We're thrilled if you're with us for the first time and we'd love to have you subscribe. So four is done, five is on the dark side. And so I know I'm gonna use that fabric. And yes, if you're a Star Wars fan, then you can make all the Star Wars jokes you want about going to the dark side. <laughs> and if you um, are a Star Wars fan, 
May the 4th be with you. We just passed May 4th. I know that's a big day for Star Wars fans. I think that's great. I think it's incredible how fans keep businesses and television shows and all kinds of things alive. And really, I think it's the fans really that give things their legacy and their history. It's the same way with quilting. You know, if women haven't been quilting for generations and generations, um, you know, we might not be doing this, but they used to sit together in basement halls and stitch together and chat and celebrate and fix the world's problems. So, and then they would pass it on to their daughters, their granddaughters and things. So I think fans and all of you subscribers are wonderful. You really do make life a joy. Alrighty, so I'm just trimming this. So are some of you thinking about what your uh, colors are going to be? Are you someone who really likes blues? Maybe you could think about a blue and white or a blue and beige combination, kind of like the laundry basket quilts. Have you heard that about, uh, have you heard of laundry basket quilts? I bet you have. So now there, if I just wanted to do a four, a little four-sided square with different colors, I could stop there and use that like as a corner block or something like that. So, because we've done one full round now, and I'm gonna check off number five. Number six, also up here on the dark half of my block. And for me, that's going to be this green with the little X's. We'll set that right there. So yeah, a blue and white, kind of a china blue and white or something would be beautiful. Um, you know, I love the aquas. In fact, I will grab another fabric collection over here. So I was looking through some of my Kimberbell basics. Now, not all of these are Kimberbell basics. That one, that one is. These two are not, but I was going to use them on my light side fabrics. But, you know, you all know, if you know me, that you know I love these colors. And so I was thinking about maybe that for my final block for the log cabin set. I'm still thinking about it. And then I was going to use very specific whites with little dots or something, but definitely light colors on the one side. That could be fun. Or maybe you want to pull out your, um, maybe you wish to pull out your scrap bin and do something all scrappy. You know, I talk about that just about every month because scrappy quilts, I love them. And I think kids really love scrappy quilts because I think it inspires them a little bit, all the patterns, all the colors. Maybe that was just me when I was a kid, but I loved the scrappy quilts that my grandma would make or that we would make together because, yeah, those colors really inspired me. Um, and that's probably why I have such a hard time choosing colors sometimes today because I just love all colors so very much. Um, that, you know, I've been known to shut down a paint store and have to come back the next day after standing there for hours. So now we're ready to go down our next side. We're just going around in a circle clockwise. So that was number six. We're done. Now number seven goes back over to the light side. And for me, that is this kind of a golden yellow here. So yeah, I think kids really love the color and I think they get inspired by the prints. And you don't know, maybe you have a little artist in the family and that kind of inspires them. And I think quilts are also great for kids because quilts really are very geometric, right? They're all very um, based on squares and stars and stuff that are all done with geometric shapes typically. I mean, we do some with curves and applique and stuff, but um, when you're piecing like this, almost all of them are geometric. And um, I think uh, that really can help kids. That can help kids with math. 
Um, it can help them with color, showing how to put color together. Maybe that's why I've never had a problem with color. You know, I get asked a lot about putting color together and all, and I know there are all these official rules that people try to lay on us about color, and I just don't think it's worth your time to worry about it. I say get in there. If you like the fabrics and you if they look pretty to your eye, then you just go ahead and put them um, together. And, you know, it really is great these days that we have fabric designers that take all the time to curate fabric collections for us because they really do help us out in that way, don't they? So that was number seven. Number eight, again, is still a light color uh, for me. It's the yellow with the dot. Kind of a confetti print almost, don't you think? There we go. So quilting can really help kids. Even if the kids don't want to learn to quilt, maybe they want to sit and watch you quilt or help you pick fabric, stuff like that. That can always be a fun time um, with you and your children or your grandchildren or your nieces and nephews for sure. Or maybe your neighbor's kids. Maybe you babysit for your neighbor's kids sometime. Have them help you. Maybe not, you know, don't get their fingers near the needles and the rotary cutters. Their parents wouldn't appreciate if you had to go get stitches in their finger, probably. But you could help, they could help you choose fabrics and things. I think that would be a lovely idea. Okay, I'm going to cut this one. So there's nothing that says quilting cannot be kind of a family activity. Believe it or not, my husband, who is a biochemist, um, and, you know, I'm a scientist in my other life, right? You guys know that um, by now. Um, my husband likes going and helping me pick fabric sometimes when we are out together. Okay, that was number eight. And now number nine is a dark color. And for me, that's going to be this one right here. And so, you know, I didn't think he would like it. I thought he would, you know, get all kind of meh, whatever. But um, no, he doesn't mind at all. It's time for us to be together. And I include him when we do that too, right? I ask him, honey, what do you think of these colors together? And there's no reason to think he doesn't know how to match colors up. He's been dressing himself for over 60 years now, so. Um, you know, he should be able to say, oh yeah, those look fine together, or, you know, not so much to my eye, or whatever. And, um, so it's definitely can be a family thing. Or maybe you think I'm nuts, and you're like, no way I'm taking my family with me to buy fabric, but that's entirely up to you. I understand that as well. This might be your thing to do by yourself. Guys, we only have one more round to go, and we're done. Isn't that cool how fast that goes? We are, yeah, I'm pretty sure we're on the last round already. Now, so, you know, earlier I said that one fabric looked a little bit like a crochet fabric. You know, like she was trying to say crochet. The log cabin really is kind of like the granny square of the quilt world. It's that rounds, it's done in rounds, and round and round you go. Now, definitely... We try to do that splitting of the colors, but there's nothing that says you have to. You could go all the way around. You could just use all of one color set if you wanted and go all the way around. That's cool. That's totally fine. Um, let me grab my thing. I think I'm going to sneeze. Excuse me, guys. I am going to sneeze. Oh, excuse me so much. It's allergy season, and um, it's been bad lately. It's finally gotten really warm in the 80s here, and so um, that's kind of really set the allergies off. All right, so number 10 is a dark fabric, and for me, it is the green with the dots. Now, remember, I said that when you get to step 10, 11, 12, and 13, you don't have to do all the trimming because we're going to trim that out at the very end. You can do a little bit in some places, but you don't have to trim your outer edges because you're going to trim those off when you take it out of the um, hoop. 
Yeah, it's really quite beautiful. Um, it's We're supposed to have a week of 70s this week, which is really lovely spring weather. The 80s is a little warm, actually, for this time of year. But, you know, all bets are off. We, uh, the weather here in Illinois is not the weather that it was when I grew up here. Now, I spent, my husband and I spent a good deal of our 41 plus years of marriage living in other states because he flew for the Navy for a while. Um, and we lived in Washington State in Seattle and up on Whidbey Island for many years, for a few decades. Um, but this is kind of warm for this time of year in Illinois. Alrighty. Now, this out here, I don't want to trim this right let me, there we go. This out here, I don't want to trim this right here because I want to make sure I have enough to trim it out at the end. So I'm going to leave that. Now, I, I can cut this much of it off. That's fine. I don't want to trim this up here either because I want to make sure I have my quarter inch at the end. This side over here, because I have another piece to put there, if I wanted, I could trim that out if I wanted. But it doesn't really matter. I don't have to do that. Alrighty. So that was piece number 10. I'm going to give it a little check. Now I'm moving on to 11, which is my light side. And for me, it's going to be this one again. I hope, oh, I hope my, my piece is long enough, is it? Yeah, it'll barely fit, but it is. I thought I still had a really long piece of it left. I guess I don't. All right. But I'm going to have enough. Because I still have that piece. Yeah, I'm going to still have plenty of it. So no problem there. Just want to make sure I had enough to do that outer edge. And I do. In fact, I can even move that down a little bit. There we go. I didn't um, iron my edge there. So I'm kind of holding that down a little bit until it gets started. There we go. So now I know a lot of you like to know how long this takes to stitch out. I'm set, I believe, I might still be set at 600 stitches a minute. I usually stitch at 700, but I switched it for something that I was doing that was really delicate that I wanted to slow down a little bit for the other day. And I don't remember if I turned it back or not. But um, so it's either six or 700 stitches per minute I've got going. And this pattern will stitch out in a total of four minutes at that speed, which makes me think it's set at 600 still. Um, but that's fast, right? That's pretty doggone quick. So that's my number 11. My number 12 is my last light color that I'm going to do. And it is that beige, that pretty beige. Um, Now, it, I know it's taking us a wee bit more time for me to do it here because, you know, I'm talking with you guys and explaining, but when you're doing it yourself, if you have your fabrics in already, you'll just whip around this with no problem at all. Okay, this piece 12. And I don't go heavy on the glue. I just give it a swipe in that blue color. That's fine because as that glue dries, that blue will go away. Oops, wrong button. And I always press these after I'm done with them as well. Sew them together. I have some videos on um, in fact, I'll try and I'll, I'll try to link that one on taking bulk out. That one I think will be um, more helpful to you. So number 12 is done. Number 13, and it's my last dark one, and I'm just going to check that off. And it is that one for me. Or at least I thought it was. Oh, golly. Please be big enough. Please, please, please. Oh, it's not going to be. Oh, no. I ran out of my fabric, y'all. Oh, I'm quite upset. 
All right, well, that's okay. If you do, you do, right? I thought I had another piece of it and I don't. Oh, wait. Oh, it's not wide enough. I do have a little piece over there, but it's not wide enough. So I'm gonna use this dark. I've only used the dark there once. I'm gonna use it again. And that's the nice thing about quilting too, is give yourself the permission to be, um, interchangeable to change things out just give yourself permission to do that these aren't going to go into a block so um if i were doing the actual quilt set with this fabric then that might be a little bit of a concern for me but i'm just demonstrating this one with this fabric for you guys so we're good no problemo last and I'm not going to trim this one out either so I've got a little bit of fabric left that's how much fabric I have left so you know I'm not throwing that away that could be a center square or it could be a number two or a number three I'm not gonna throw that away that piece although it wasn't big enough for this long side it's big enough for somewhere else <coughs> So I will not throw that away either. All right, now the very last step that you're going to do is you're going to stitch all the way around the block and that tacks everything down and together, okay? Um, and I like to take my embroidery tape, any embroidery tape, doesn't matter, and I like to put it over the seams, stick in my finger there, um, where those pieces of fabric come together, where there's a chance of it, the foot hooking on the fabric. Um, and then I just peel it off when I'm done. Now I'm not gonna put one there because that's not going to um, get uh, trapped by that. But those other three little places, I wouldn't put it all the way around unless you know there was lots of little open spaces all the way around. Alrighty, now we're going to do the very last one and then we'll take it out and we'll trim it out of the stabilizer. See, now that very likely would not get caught, um, but you never know. And the last thing I want you to have to do is worry about it getting caught. That would just make me into a crazy person. I mean, you can always undo it and snip it and re... I mean, there's always ways to fix it, right? But let's not have to if we don't need to. Alrighty, now let's take this out and let's flip over to our other camera. And there we go. So here we go. Those were those little strips I told you I had left. Not wide enough. Long enough. Not wide enough. Bummer, right? Total bummer. All right, so I've got all of my squares checked off. I knew which side was light, which side was dark. I knew when to stop trimming on my outer so I can set that. And I keep this, and for my block sets, I just keep making checks as I go around. That way, when I'm making them, I know, oh, okay, I'm on my third block, I'm at place number eight or number 12 or whatever and I know where I am and I don't have to do one of these for each and every block. Alrighty, so now we're going to remove this. Peel away my tape. Now, even though we're using embroidery tape, which is low tack, which is what you want if you're not using actual embroidery tape, if you're using a medical tape or a painter's tape, please get something that says low tack for fine finish, anything like that, because again, that has less chemical in it and it's, less, it's going to be less of a problem in the long run for eating away at your fabric. And trust me, even if you wash it, eventually down the road, you're going to find places where it eats away at your fabric and it's because you use something that had glue in it 
and you still had a glue residue left over. All right, so now see our outer um, stitch line? That's now going to be our um, line where we're going to measure for our quarter inch. So we're gonna take our ruler, we're gonna find our quarter inch line. We're going to put that quarter inch all the way down the block. Now I'm just turning mine a little bit. I am a lefty, so you've been given fair warning. Now this is the little this is the little um, rotary cutter that snipped my finger up last week. I'm surprised that it's healed up like this. So um, on the second third day, they said take everything off, clean the stitches will come out and all of that. And then they said to put this antibiotic medicine on it. Sorry, I'm taking a drink of my coffee. And um, and then just keep a little finger cut on it. Don't put a big old heavy Band-Aid on it. So I did. And you know, it was never super sore. I mean, it was the first day or so, maybe a little bit. It was sore, tender more than sore. Um, but boy, oh boy, did it heal up like it's supposed to. Now, they also, and I can attest to this as a biologist, they told me to take extra vitamin C because vitamin C is what helps us have good skin and it helps heal our skin. So I took a little extra vitamin C and I can't, I mean, like I said, I can feel the scar and I can barely see it, but I can't see it in my camera. Well, maybe I can just a little bit right there, but um, it's like it wasn't even there and it doesn't hurt, but I have learned my lesson to be a little more cautious. <laughs> Alrighty, so, and this is how I did it. I was trimming my edges. I always trim them at an angle, help get a little bulk out. Um, if you're new to us, I like using a pinking blade for um, uh, cutting out of my stabilizer because it helps take bulk out. So there's my block. There's my first block now. These blocks aren't going to match up there, right? But they would match up there. Kind of in an opposite direction kind of a thing. But there. That could be interesting. I don't know. You could put those together however you want, but aren't they pretty? Love them. Okay, everybody. So that is our log cabin. That is our month of May. Now, if you see me looking away, whoops, wrong one. There we go. If you see me looking away a little bit, it's because we're using some new, um, there we go. We're using some new video technology and I'm still kind of getting used to where I'm supposed to click. And also, um, that's why if you see me like looking over here, that's why. <laughs> so this is our May, 2023 log cabin block of the month. If you wish, to get your free pattern. If you've been with us for a while, you know exactly where to go. But if you're new with us, you just go to our website, sewingcommon.com, and you can get it. It's completely free. It's up, it's available for you. Um, we would love for you to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Um, we're really growing. We're over 3,500 folks now since January. I love it. For me, that's amazing. And all of you have just been amazing throughout all of this. I love getting to um, uh, do these videos for you. I love it on our last uh, uh, one of the month where we do our live Q and A's. So please uh, subscribe, click the little bell so that you get um, notification when I add new um, content. And is that the only one that's I have there? Yep. Oh, nope. Here's the other one I made. If you need to contact us, not Diana at Sew in Common anymore. Please uh, contact us at support at sewincommon.com. Um, I was missing things in my personal email that I've been giving you. So please um, do uh, your messages to us at support at sewincommon.com. That way I'll make sure and get back with you because that's only for you guys. So that's good, right? All right. You can also leave your um, comments or show photographs that you've done of your blocks at our Facebook page, which is so in common. So 
uh, easy to remember that. All right, everybody. So, oh, you know the one I didn't make? <gasps> I'm so bad. I didn't make the little banner that says what I tell you at the end of every vid video. Go so life beautiful, you guys. I'll have one ready for next week. So until next time, everybody, truly, go so life beautiful. Go make yourself some log cabins because next Sunday's video, we are going to show you the log cabin set that we're going to use. And this week, I have a new product coming out. It is not the blocks. That's still coming out in June. In fact, let me just say, if you want to be in the running for the prize, and Sunday, maybe Sunday I can show you what the prize is going to be for whoever's name choice for this new product in June, the blocks sets. Um, maybe I'll have everything in by then and I can show that to you. Um, so put your little comments, what you want to call. They're the basic blocks in multiple sizes, okay? The first one is going to be dedicated to not just the half square triangle. There's going to be a couple blocks in multiple sizes in that set. Um, so that contest is going, so put your little names in there. I've gotten several, actually. Um, there's a few that I really like, but I'm, I'm letting other people help me with that, so I'm impartial um, on choosing, but there's several that I've, that I've heard that I like. Um, but this week, I have a new product coming out, and it's a good gadget. Ooh. So subscribe, click that little bell. You'll get notifications when that video get, goes out. Again, everybody, have a great day, and until next time, so life beautiful. Bye for now, everybody.